Um, so, you know, kind of um, the gist is that you know, I'm, uh, ZK is not really good at taking care of privacy for shared states. And, you know, I think people started to realize this when, you know, trying to build something like Uniswap inside zero knowledge, right? And I think um, if we want to build privacy for shared states, which is, uh, you know, what, 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 what blockchain is really good for, we need to look at other techniques such as FPC, FHE, or trust execution environments. And uh, this is kind of what resulted in me looking at um, those techniques. And, you know, the techniques that I focused on was FHE, and it turns out that basically that's plain FHE is not enough because there's a still a single decryption key that, uh, the, you know, the single key holder will be able to get to the, the underlying data or state. And so, um, along that direction, you, you kind of need to threshold the sheet where there's a group of committees taking in charge of the secrets and passing it along. Um, and, and then the question becomes, you know, how do you manage each of the computations? So you, you still need zero knowledge computation because they're really great for private states. And, you know, uh, you still want replicated computation uh, to be done in the um, in, in second census, and, and you want threshold efforts to be done. How do you interface between those three? And and that's kind of the the crux of the um, the work that I did in Pesca, which is to propose, hey, you know, you could do as much computation as uh, as you as you could in zk, and as little computation um, as you need to in FPG, and still have pretty good privacy guarantees for at least two applications. One is um, you know constant function market makers, and one is um, uh, first price options. So. I guess I'm sorry, I'm not talking over any slides. Um, I assume you know people are quite familiar with um, some of the concepts, and hopefully that was a good, good overview of the intro. Um, and I think, I think you know perhaps since it's a discussion section, I can pass pass the mic back, and you know we can um, start diving into details where you know discussing the trade offs between between different things. So um, like uh oh you can go James if you oh, want. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh something I'm I'm curious about, and maybe I uh just uh haven't read the Pesco paper closely enough, is uh when you do this homomorphic, uh fully homomorphic encryption, like someone needs to encrypt the transaction and then it's encrypted and I and it uh I assume it uh changes this encrypted state of the blockchain and then it needs to be decrypted so that it's human readable. Where do these steps occur or, you know, who has access to the, to the encryption and decryption keys? Uh, how does all of that work mechanically? Yeah, I think that's the main difference between like smart FHE and uh, you know, that paper, I think, you know, was also mentioned on the reading list and PESCA, right? So the, the authority that actually could decrypt is the consensus set, right? So it is uh, effectively assuming that if majority of the, Consensus. So assume right now there's a static set of set of nodes, and two thirds of them will need to be there to decrypt the FPG ciphertext, right? So so that's that's the that's the guarantee that um, uh, at least I said we want in in you know in a blockchain environment because that's for safety of consensus. You you know you want two uh, two thirds majority like, at least for BFT protocols, right? So let's reuse that assumption for data privacy, right? So so effectively if you assume that two thirds are honest in, in, in this setup, uh, then you know no state is decrypted besides the ones that's supposed to be decrypted, well, meaning the outputs. And so when you encrypt the chain, in fact, you were saying, you know, so like the encryptor, like when you encrypt the inputs, you know that you know you know the input, right? But uh, effectively, the, the authority for this private state is is the chain, right? So um, and if and what what is the decryption criteria? What the decryption criteria is. Uh, for the application that you're calling, if you know the application that you're calling gets to specify what is to be decrypted, right? And the chain honors that, and the chain says, okay, the application says, please decrypt this output part. It could be the entire thing, or it could be a very, very small piece of information of your input. Um, and you know, as long as two or three are honest, then uh, you know that is uh, honored. So even if the the person uh, you know uh, making the transaction so even if they are the ones encrypting 
uh, it is possible for the state or for an, for some like threshold based committee to to decrypt it. There's no access to like a special key that you know where the the encryptor can has the power to decide sort of who has access to this. Um, yeah, so there's special things you could build on top, right? So I think you know if you want. Uh, so may, maybe this it was a broader question of how do you so like privacy is it's, so so, so may, maybe let me explain a little bit kind of my position on privacy. Uh, maybe maybe it will help. So privacy is a really broad term. You know, it's it's about how how do you control the flow of information uh, that's you know supposed to be private for certain certain set of people, right? And so really, it's about uh, whose information it is. And how do you, which set of people do you want to give it to, and which set of kind of functions on the on the data you want to give it to, right? And so uh, it's it is often not just like you know all or nothing for privacy, right? And and this is a particular instance of privacy where uh, we are saying that application state it is you know can decide like the logic for the application state uh, can decide what to release, and the chain will say okay, well I will do that, right? So it really depends on logic. So, because logic inside the FPC circuit, the FPC circuit could you know specify any function over this private data, uh, and you could say that uh, so like you know uh, this you know so for instance we can do read encryption so we can do uh, you know threshold maybe may, so rand I think uh, you know was talking about something like like this that they were doing you know at, at, at Zama but effectively you can you have a program program of threshold encryption where the logic says you know actually please release the data underneath underneath here to to this key and you know with threshold number amount of people amount among the uh you know uh persons and nodes the data is kind of will, will be will go from okay this is a blockchain data that's private you know to everyone but like the threshold number of people can, can see to uh encrypted to to be under this key and then whoever holds that key will be root encrypt so um yeah, so something like that is possible, but you know, I, I, at the current moment, there's no special like solutions for it. It will be very, very, very inefficient um, to do that. You, I can comment on that way if you want, actually. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, hey everyone. Um, so yeah, so you know, way you and I spoke a few months ago, right, about uh, the different designs. So we we iterated quite a bit. I think you can think of the uh, of the threshold FHE protocol as a separate oracle. It actually makes it a little bit easier to reason in terms of interaction. So you've got the network doing consensus on encrypted state and encrypted values. Uh, so that's just a regular blockchain that you've augmented to be able to do FHE computation. And then you need some decryption oracle in order to give visibility on those encrypted states, right? Um, and so that Oracle itself is a threshold network to guarantee that nobody has the key. So you do a distributed key generation, and then you do a threshold decryption protocol. Um, but all the logic for visibility can be encoded in the smart contract itself. So you can think of it as an access control list. So you know like how your ERC-20 token, you have like a, a spendable uh, thing you can set, so you can delegate uh, your token to be spent by someone else. Think of this for visibility. Right, so you can basically have a smart contract set which address can view which ciphertext, and the oracle is just running a full node, basically looking at what it's supposed to allow for decryption uh, in terms of incoming requests. Um, and so, by doing that, you have complete control at the applications uh, level uh, of the visibility of the smart of the uh, ciphertext being uh, computed on, um, and it's quite inefficient. I mean, it depends what you call inefficient, I guess. Uh, so we we have like a TFHE uh, threshold uh, protocol. Uh, I guess the number of participants, of course, makes it more and more you know inefficient. But it takes yeah, it takes a few seconds to decrypt, right? So it's not too bad, right? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, like blockchain level latency is not too bad, uh, but it's a few seconds. Um, so I guess so in terms of number of bits you're decrypting, um, that's just the third part, right? On latency. So regarding, so whether you're decrypting one bit in TFHE or you know like a megabyte, um, did, did that change the? That's the um, so we, I mean, I guess yes. So in in TFHE specifically, 
uh, you can basically have up to eight bits of message per ciphertext. So if you want to compute on large integers, like 64 bits or something, you have to basically uh, use multiple ciphertext for different and using some kind of, uh, of representation. Um, so in practice, you know, you're decrypting multiple ciphertexts, but it's not actually slower because you can decrypt them separately anyway. Um, and technically on the Treasure protocol, if you want to give a specific user visibility without anybody seeing it, you have to do some kind of re-encryption uh, instead of a pure decryption. Uh, but the protocol is actually the same, effectively. Uh, so it's quite nice. It's it's a fairly complex protocol. I think that I think the write-up is about 250 pages. Um, but you know, it works. So, you know, give, give us a few months and we'll bring it down to something much smaller. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah, th and thanks for Jumping in burning context. And so I guess like I do have another question. Like if sorry for um you guys even anyone else, anyone uh, something like question or comment on that, please jump in. Um but but I was gonna say um so so it is a special technique, right, to do threshold to room encryption. Yeah. And it is still under this it's still the same encrypt uh, effectively. So you're encry encrypting from one threshold committee to another threshold committee, correct? Yeah, so so the whole protocol is basically very similar to what you have in your paper, right? So you have a public key encryption under a shared network public key for evaluation, right? Uh, and then you have a threshold uh, decryption and re-encryption protocol, which is basically an MPC protocol that implements the, uh, uh, the decryption uh, uh, logic, right? So you can think of it as, a, as an MPC protocol with secret sharing for the uh, private key, uh, and that's how you do it. Um, and so there are multiple ways you can do that. In our case, uh, we're basically using a pretty standard type of MPC technique. So there's really nothing fancy there. Uh, it's just nobody had done it for TFHE specifically. You'd be surprised how little protocol work has been done on FHE uh, because nobody really had to think about something like that before, right? Um, so we, we just found out that everything had to be built. So one question related to that is that like, so in these cases, actually, eventually there will be MPC involved and user is basically sending data to this party and that like the computation can be done on chain, but eventually this party will be revealing the data. So basically it's a FHE doing the computation and MPC yeah. doing the decryption. What exactly. if we, because in this, in a lot of this situation, we can also safely assume that this party that are doing the decryption can communicate with each other. That's how the MPC will work. Yeah. And why not just do the entire thing in MPC so that user sending that data to like this consensus group, they do the entire computation inside MPC, but not in FHE. And later they just, there is also no decryption inside the MPC. It just send the data to the respected user. Basically, that like if this entire model about well, clearly there will be some challenges about a more precise like threshold because uh, MPC with like special threshold probably will be more complicated. But basically, that like this seems to be a more efficient model, and the user experience might be even better if we just don't use any FHE but only MPC. How do you type challenge this type of the like position like opinion? Uh, I, I guess it's, it's it's a debate about MPC versus FHE in general, right? Uh, I don't think that you know, uh, I don't think there is an easy answer to that. But I can tell you something. So um, uh, the person who's now leading our blockchain team actually was the founder of an MPC company, right? And he decided to stop working on MPC because uh, what he found is that the there is an incompressible latency due to network communication, right? And so the advantage of FHE is that you don't really have that. So there is a lot more room for vertical scaling and improvement of performance in FHE specifically. So I think today you're right that FHE is going to be less efficient than MPC for, I would say, basic computation. But that might not be the case uh, like four or five years from now. Um, it's also a simple model to reason on. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Uh, what we've been working on at the moment is basically extending the EVM to support uh, homomorphic operations so that from the developer's perspective, you're just writing solidity code, uh, but you're now manipulating in encrypted integers. It's very easy to do that in FHE because literally we take the EVM and we just overload some opcodes, add some precompiles, and then now we have a FHE EVM. 
if you wanted to do that in MPC, you'd have to do a lot more work on the protocol side that wouldn't be straightforward. Got it. Then two follow-up questions. I think the first one is regarding that. Basically, that uh, MPC communication used to be a huge issue for MPC. But like, since the invention of the silent OT, actually the situation has changed such that in slow network, even the MPC can be like pretty good. So I, I feel that something about MPC have changed. And the second thing is that like, I think the debate about MPC and FHE eventually will need to come down to like performance like evaluation. That's whether, because uh, you actually have a very good point that FHE actually provide a more black box like way so that like for like the EVM, they just need to handle the data. And if it's in MPC, it needs to be more complicated. That might be special data structure saying that, ah, this is data number 72 inside the MPC. And the MPC actually need to handle the entire EVM logic as well, to some extent. And uh, I think my question is that, like, do you think that like the user experience provided by basically fully MPC or like FHE plus MPC would be that different for the user? Um, so can I perhaps like also answer the previous question just a little bit? I think so. I think if you so if you look at these are really broad groups of categories of solutions. And when we talk about FHG, you know, what Red is talking about, it's also building special MPC protocols for particular parts of this, right? You had you have key generation, uh, mm -hmm. probably you know, key rotation that's you know coming in now, and you know, threshold encryption and threshold encryption. Each of those are is special MPC protocols. Um and it, so like I think that the main contention between these two categories is the following. It's really what is the the complexity of like MPC shared data? You know, this is actually the question, the fundamental question is, is, is actually on the MPC. Uh for threshold FPG, the key is only the decryption key that's inside the MPC. So when you do like uh, when you resample a committee, so if you do this in blockchain setting where nodes can eat, come in and out, the, the data is it's it's really succinct compared to the number, number of applications that's run. Uh and in MPC, there's there's two different settings. Uh, one is you, you you have this you know service uh, similar to the FHE case where users are not part of the MPC. Users are simply submitting inputs. In that case, you have this you, you have a bigger problem because it's in the MPC secret shared you know uh, at least you know in standard MPC like that uh, is very large, right? If you want to maintain long term long term secrets, long term program states like a Uniswap state. Uh, and then I think there's a separate category, which is if users is part of the MPC, then that's like, you know, completely, probably a separate solution um, uh, that that wouldn't. So I'm, I'm, it's more comparing at the third FPG, MPC as, as an on-chain service, right? Um, and I don't think, I, I mean, I think morally that it's the same, it, it's, it's really just depends on the trade-offs of like, do you want long-term running pro, uh, secret programs with, with secret states where, at, you know, the operating nodes, We'll, we'll, we'll go offline, come back online, or you know, do you want something that with much smaller number, number of nodes and um, you know, utilize? So yeah, it also depends on computation, right? Like MPC, FHE, the the computation that's they're more efficient that is is different. So um, yeah, it, yeah, I think it's a great question. It, 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 there's no reason why like you wouldn't be MPC first and FHE. You know, um, I mean, yeah, I, I think it usually depends. I think there were some MPC-based uh, smart contract platforms, right? Uh, uh, even years ago, um, they were not very efficient back then. But if there are some new techniques in MPC, and I'm not an expert in MPC, to be honest, so maybe there is some new stuff in it that uh, would make that more practical. It's a good question. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll read up a little bit more on it. And if I find something interesting, I can send it to you guys. Yeah, I think there's some work from um, Andrew Miller's group. I mean, maybe, Tom, you can... I, you know, there's, there's a, uh, so, so they, um, you know, they, they have, uh, I haven't forgot the name, but it was presented at, uh, 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 SESC at Berkeley. Like it is basically the same thing as, um, or I guess it's a good, it's a good house like difference maybe. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, the, I, I'm not working on like this, uh, part of it specifically, uh, but yeah, there is like a, uh, group i think sylvain's a bit more involved with it that uh uh is trying to yeah build like an npc make uh based automated market maker uh for example but... yeah uh hi well in terms of comparing with fhe i i don't know enough actually about it 
Uh, and recently, I have been also working on other projects that are trusted hardware based. But um, yeah, I unfortunately don't have much to contribute at that level of technical details or, or com for comparisons. But definitely, there's there's with MPC there's the problems also of of setting up the committee and choosing the committee. But I guess you have the same problem with threshold FHE, right? Uh, if I understood correctly. Um, yeah. Yeah, but in, yeah, in terms of performance, specifically for computations, I I don't know. We have we haven't like yeah. I mean, it also depends on you know, which what type of MPC you're doing, and I think, I think yeah. in Hawk, um, I was like where paper back in 2016, right? It was, uh, oh, or the ZK Hawk, right? That's the new one. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess coming back to the same point, I think, I think it's really like what is actual secret share states? You know, even even if you're trying to you're you're doing secret sharing of of the um, um, decryption key, right? It, it's but it's just much more succinct, and, and I think you know. So right now, is maybe we'll have a spectrum, right? So like. You will want succinct uh, secret share state because it's easier to 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 run uh, this long term protocols where nodes come in and out, like in a blockchain setting, uh, right? And, and you know, like so, even inside MPC, I think there's like solutions where you know you push the data to be more succinct. I actually not not sure, not not an expert on that. Um, yeah, so so I, you know I think if you if you run like a small number of nodes where you have known parties behind them that's like enterprises you know this is the thing about applications then it perhaps makes more sense to to you just have like two out of three MPC or something uh, but if you potentially are thinking you know we're gonna have people run this service uh, like on commodity hardware then you know I I don't think having an empty service actually holding these super shared states for a lot of um, you know, a lot of different programs is going to make sense. Wait, I have a kind of a basic question. You you mentioned the the kind of the main difference I think between the PESCA and Smart FHE papers. They're not employing any sort of um, threshold FHE. What are, what are the actual risks? Uh, yeah, I think in, in Pesca you kind of just state that there's risks of um, of uh, having having the um, encryption keys centralized. But um, yeah, I wasn't quite clear on. Yeah, so um, maybe you know, back to maybe a similar point is you know privacy is, it shouldn't be like all or nothing, right? Um, and and we want sometimes programmable ways of saying what is the data we want to release and what is the uh, entity we're releasing this to, right? And and before that, like you don't want so if, if you if you have a centralized you know service that you everyone trusts, you can just even give the data directly to that entity and then have them you know release different parts of it to the different different people, right? But uh, I think we're operating in this blockchain setting where we, we don't want that centralized point of trust. So, you know, so so there's different different targets we want. Right? We, we want security, we want safety of these, of these um, uh, you know, of, of running this, this process, right? Like that's what blockchain is. But we also want privacy of running this process, right? This, of this process being, you know, uh, uh, some, some fixed state machine like that, that we all agree upon and then want to do computation on. And so, um, and that's where kind of running a single a single key FHE uh, on a, in a blockchain setting is, is a bit odd because you have you know this BFT like uh, trust for safety, but you have a single trust single point of failure for for privacy, right? And so um, you know they're somewhat incompatible, well, not incompatible, but you know if you if you like trying to go blockchain ethos of decentralization and you know, removing trust on single, uh, you know, single source, then you can need to move away from it. Yeah, I mean, I guess there would be all sorts of uh, MEV attacks and things like that you could, you could employ if you're just using a single key. Um, so I, I think in PESCA, uh, as well as what we're doing at Zama, you have technically one key, it's just distributed amongst, you know, a number of parties, right? And so nobody has the ability alone to decrypt anything. Uh, so as long as you're 
as long as the parties involved in the threshold protocol are, you know, one third honest, at least, right, then you're good. Um, and so that's a that's a valid assumption in a decentralized protocol because you know if most of your participants are corrupted, then your blockchain is also corrupted. Um, and so at that point, the, the only thing to to be fair, uh, when I was thinking a little bit about this privacy model, is the incentive for corrupting the blockchain is usually financial, right? So it's basically cheating on the states. But the incentive for corrupting the uh, decryption participants is privacy, so it's visibility. And you could argue that like a nation state attacker, you know, could technically, you know, spend whatever, 10 billion, if that gives them full visibility on the network. But it's very hard to protect against that in any kind of thing. Like Tor has this issue, for example, right? Uh, you know, it's very hard to tell how many of the Tor nodes are corrupted right now by government uh, agencies. Um, I'm not sure there is a solution to that, quite frankly. And I think like if you try to optimize for protecting against the US or Russia or whatever, you're, you're probably never going to launch that in the first place. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, actually, I have some questions about the majority assumption here. Because uh, let's say considering the plain text, uh, plain text uh, situation, and uh, consider, let's say something like Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think a majority assumption would be like, uh, let's say reasonable. But uh, considering for the private setting, not only is the reason you mentioned before, let's say a state uh, malicious, powerful, big man will, let's say, have enough power and money to do so. But another thing is like, uh, if someone did something wrong, it's hard to tell that. Because if you consider uh, Bitcoin, even 50, over 51% uh, power are malicious, the honest node still can tell something happened. They can, they, they can refuse to give money, they can refuse to deliver the goods until they know what happened. But uh, let's say in the private setting, in the encrypted setting, it's hard to tell the, the, the yeah, let's say the know. honest node cannot tell that. Yeah, you don't know. And th there are many issues around that <clears throat> uh, which are hard to solve. You know, for example, uh, you need to rotate the shares, right? Uh, but the problem is, once the participants are no longer incentivized to keep the share private because they're not getting paid anymore, what prevents them from just selling it, right? So how do you guarantee erasures of previous shares and things like that? But like these are like common problems to any MPC protocol in that sense. And there are solutions to that. But you know, eventually, part of the solution is to have some kind of reputation system in place as well for the privacy setting. So one thing we're thinking, for example, here is to have like two thirds of the uh, um, uh, the participants in a threshold protocol like decentralized, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. add proof of stake type thing. And one third to be known entities, like uh, maybe MIT or like, you know, some trusted entities because they wouldn't be able to decrypt with one third, but they would be able to prevent uh, malicious people from having, you know, two thirds of the power. And so you have to find ways like that to kind of like try to make it more difficult. But there is definitely no cryptographic solution to the problem because as you said, you have no idea when someone cheated. There is nothing on chain to see that. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. actually Algorand did something similar. I remember. Yeah, exactly, because Algorand had exactly the same problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they donate a lot of tokens to let's say some universities. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or you know, like the Beacon Oracle uh, for the rem sorry, the random nest Oracle. I think I don't remember how it's called. Uh, they have like 20 parties involved. Uh, all of them are like listed on the website and sort of like, you know, uh, we're, we're generating random numbers. You have to trust us to generate correct random numbers, but at least you know who we are. And we are supposedly trusted or semi-trusted entities, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really great question. You know, it's really about accountability and sashability. Uh, and, you know, I, I think this is an emergent area where we, in, in, instead of wanting to assume that people are honest, we want to incentivize honest behavior uh, in, in some type of system where misbehavior is, is uh, you know, discouraged. Uh, and this is easy in the setting, uh, you know, in, in this public state transition setting, if you public incorrect state transition or, some, or you know, vote for an incorrect state transition, you're slashed. And it's also actually easy in a, in a signature setting. I think so. You can, I think, you can slash, um, you know, generational special signatures. Uh, I, I believe, you know. So if you are, if you have a share for a wrong signature, you can, you can 
you know, slash them. But I, but I think, so like the question is really for this type of privacy protocols, you're like the misbehavior is, you know, decrypting a state, uh, you were decrypting something that, that you're not supposed to decrypt. How do you capture that, that notion? And if you, you know, is there any, so I think the overall question is, can we design, you know, as a, a MPC or IPC protocols that is that are sl slashable in some limited setting, um, right? And, and like, first of all, like how do you even define slashability for, for this? Uh, you know, is, is the definition general enough to, to apply to the you know the privacy case? And second of all, like do we have constructions? You know, maybe for simple simple transition functions at first, and then and then talk about more general. And I think I, I did spend a little bit of time on it. I think um, uh, you know, and. and so like this, so like I was, I was talking with Shiram uh, from um, um, Layer Labs, and and like a full general solution might not be might not be uh, possible. I, I'm not you know maybe if there's more MPC experts in the room, but effectively you know you think about like suppose you have a secret key factory, right? like two thirds, right? What, what what's the problem? Like you want to be able to catch who is who is colluding, right? You want to uh, you know, because two thirds like let's say if the threshold is like two thirds, two thirds needs to collude, and so um but when but if they do you want to first be able to tell that they colluded like there's a wrong information being computed and who who colluded it right but they can always run a special MPC protocol to because they have enough to reconstruct the key right uh and you know so like that function of driving the key and compete computing any any function on, on the on, on you be under on, on the line underlying secret whether it be description or any any arbitrary transition could be done inside MPC so they could do a special MCC protocol to collude and not, you know, not simply just pass around their shares or pass around the decryption. And uh, yeah, and so effectively, like there's nothing much I think you could do even in the general setting to to really, you know, slash people. Um, I don't know, that might, might be vague, but, you know, I think just other MCC experts in the room, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I'm not really sure of a good way to do uh, yeah to set up like a fair kind of like slashing thing. Like my first, I don't know if I was just like thinking about this kind of from scratch. My first thought would be like, okay, well, what if everyone who has a key share has to like have some kind of stake, and then if anyone manages to, uh, you know, like reconstruct like the like whole threshold key, then they can use it to take everyone's stake. But that wouldn't necessarily be fair to uh, honest nodes who aren't uh, colluding. So. So yeah, in that setting, you know, if two thirds, those two thirds are supposed to have two thirds of the stake, right? But then they can reconstruct and get the entire stake. Uh, stake means that there's has something to gain, so therefore they will collude, right? Um, yeah. So it's about like when you, when you collude, you need to be able to catch who colluded. Um, hmm. It's kind of like well, yeah, you know, and then if and if you're doing yeah, a Shamir based like a uh, sharing scheme, then that's like yeah, inherently you don't get that. <laughs> yeah. So I think that that's like one open area. Like if we can have like accountability for for these threshold systems um, i have the feeling that this is basically impossible basically that it seems not difficult to get an impossibility result on that because let's say that if all the nodes just tell the key to the government but the government is smart enough so that they just look at everything but don't do things then technically you just cannot break that or even let's say if intel actually provide the master key of the te to the government several years ago then we also know, don't know that. Yeah, but I think if we, so in that condition, if they did this action, but not release it to the public, then of course there's, there's no, no reason that you can prove that that thing happens. But you know, maybe the question is, so suppose that we define, like there's consensus defined like the state machine, right? Like so, suppose we're in this SDL strategy setting, we know that things are supposed to be decrypted, okay? And there's, Perhaps information, like can you define like so? These are the information that's ever supposed to be decrypted out associated with this state machine yeah, because there's a well-defined, you know, state machine history, and you know, can we possibly define like you know, if someone colluded and decrypted something additional, then we can catch them, right? So like there's two, like so one is can we even say like there's something that's decrypted that's additional, right? Uh, and then second, can we catch them? So so maybe in that setting, like where you where, where, it, where it has external effects, the data actually got leaked, like the decrypted data um, got leaked, maybe there's a way to do it. Um, 
The general way to tie up like bypass this problem in like FHE, MPC, and CK is to assuming that the user is actually part of the like one of the party of the key. So if the user loses their own key, then that's the user's problem. Uh, we dive already do that in Zcash and so on. Basically, that in zk privacy, we usually trust that like first of all, forget about the universal setup. Then the rest is that as long as the user is the one generating the proof, like the privacy is always guaranteed. Uh, for FHE MPC, if we also have the user to be part of it, it will be good. But the problem is that what if the later the user is offline, and what if you have a lot of the user? So, I th I don't think you can actually trace back the privacy model in a smart contract platform to a specific user, because a smart contract is an application, and sometimes assets are tied to a specific user, like a token balance, for example. But sometimes, you know, it could be an encrypted state, which should be visible by multiple people or no one. I don't know, for example, the amount of liquidity in a liquidity pool that's encrypted. Um, so in that case, you know, there wouldn't be like a user key per se, right? Um, because there is no user who owns the privacy here. Um, so that's why I think, you know, it's, it's a different privacy model than Zcash completely. Uh, I really think that like for FHE, smart contracts, you have to think of privacy from the application's perspective. And if a user doesn't agree on the application and the smart contracts like uh, access control logic, they just shouldn't use the smart contract, right? The same way that if you don't agree on how a contract will spend your tokens, you just shouldn't use a smart contract. Um, it's really the same model. For me, ownership of assets and ownership of visibility on, 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 uh, on data is the same concept just applied on financial versus uh, privacy things. So w one question I have also, you know, one kind of remaining doubt. So, you know, with, you know, Zama building our uh, first refugee, you know, with uh, just more attention on thresholds, uh, cryptography to, to get privacy. If we, if we can't get, um, a slash obviously right uh, i think that the benefits of having uh, confidentiality and smart contracts and privacy is outweighs the risk of that happening. Um, again, like I'm not trying to be concerned about the US government taking over the whole network because there's really nothing we can do about that. You know, uh, we could rotate the Oracle, but they would still have, you know, visibility of previous stuff. For the slashing itself, um, what we're currently thinking about is running the, uh, so you basically do a secret share, right? So nobody has, you know, the whole key. Uh, and then you run the decryption and you keep the shares in an enclave, right? Uh, an HSM or SGX doesn't matter. Uh, and what you want is you want to rotate those shares faster than it takes uh, time to do a key, uh, a side channel attack, right? Um, and so hopefully if someone's trying to attack the actual uh, hardware to retrieve the keys, well, they won't have time because the keys will rotate already in the meantime. Like, so trying to think a little bit about building a protocol like that, which again, apparently is like very common in MPC um, uh, to solve that kind of problems. And, and of course you could still slash people, right? Uh, and you could even do it kind of like a, almost as a fraud proof type of mechanism. You know, if someone can prove conclusively that someone cheated, uh, then maybe you can slash them or something. Um, but, the, but what if the, what if you keep this, you know, node offline, like, how how are you how are you making sure that the TE inside the TE the, the keys are actually getting rotated? Like it's probably some time. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, no. That, that's that's a good point. No, it, that's a good point. But um, yeah. But by the time, so you need to have all the uh, sorry. So there's two types of attack. There is an attack where you're running two thirds of the uh, threshold nodes. Honestly, if you're able to do that, I don't think there's much we can do. Right. Uh, and then there is an attack where, you know, I'm a validator or like I'm a threshold node. Uh, I've already made money. The keys are rotated, right? How do I prevent each of them to collude off chain saying, hey, we're no longer using those shares. 
let's actually you know sell it to whoever is willing to buy that from us right and that's what you can prevent with those rotation systems so you you can prevent otherwise honest validators from selling something that they no longer use uh but i really don't think you can prevent like a two-thirds yeah if someone just takes over the network they take over the network and then that's it you know game over i guess for that point but uh, we'll, we'll try to make it very difficult to do that obviously yeah yeah actually i, I have another yeah, yeah for, for, uh, for the rotation part i i remember augur and uh, you know something like uh, where i've and mm -hmm. every every uh, every time they produce a new block they change to i say they move the state with a community to another community and uh, yeah with vrf and i think uh, let's say uh, we can also use a, sim a similar way um, another thing is i mean for eventually why is a uh, why is a privacy is hard to be solved because you need i think one reason i feel one reason is uh, you need to decrypt mm -hmm. if you don't really need to decrypt things it does uh, will that make the thing simpler let's say oh, yeah. I, I have a key and nobody I, I assume nobody should know that key and we don't want to decryption we just need to check the state move from this state to another state and there are yeah. some ways to do so right yeah, I mean, you, you can do that, but you would be severely limiting the use cases because, you know, even taking, again, the simplest contracts, you know, a token contract, uh, you can do all of the logic for transferring tokens and checking balances, you know, encrypted with FHE, but then at some point, the user needs to be able to know and see their balance, right? And so there needs to be a decryption at some point of the encrypted balance of the user that was used for the computation. So I, I think, like, if you don't have the ability to decrypt, uh, then you, you can't really build any significant user experience. Uh, yeah. Let's take another example. If only the user has the state and they do the encryption and uh, all other parties ah, do not need I see. to. I see. No, so the other issue here is that you wouldn't have a, so if every mm -hmm. user is using a different key to encrypt the data, that is not, you're not going to be able to Combine the ciphertexts. Uh, I mean, if you have a fair shimmer scheme, you can share, a, let's say, common secret, a common encryption scheme, right? And for that, with that scheme, as long as one par party forgets their key, then yeah. this scheme should be considered as secure enough. I, I think it depends on application, right? Like, if, you know, as Ryan is saying, if, if, like, so what is application we're thinking of here? Do we need to comp compute something jointly over you know this data that you, each user has? Uh, you know, and what is this data, right? So, you know, a probably better example, like for, for like, uh, you know, why we need like on-chain computation compute is is a a, a trading market, right? A uh, trading market is where everyone have access to, like you want to submit trades, and the trades should be settled, but also there's the information you want to get from it, which is what's your trade valid, uh, and what's what is the current spot price. Right. So, so, you know, um, that, that's like, a, that state is, is not owned by any, anyone, right? Like, whereas for payments, how much token you, you have, how much token you pay, it's kind of private between either you or another, another person. Right. And in that case, everything can be done in ZK, right? Like Zcash done it, you know, almost, almost 10 years ago. Right. So, um, so it's really about the application and what, what is that information and who should see that information. Um, and it seems that the problem is that for such a general purpose like FHE computation platform on chain, like all the data will be encrypted on under some key, and the user is not going to be the only key owner. So basically, that all the decryption basically all need to go through this like like cluster of the node. Yeah, Even the, only the user should be the only only person knowing that data. No, no, I I I think I disagree. Right, like think about the a trading market example. You know. That, that market is not we want we want like a decentralized uh uh you know dex you know that's that's highest most people's trades and so you should be able to see your trade like i want to trade this much to this much but you need to you know, know the price and you need to know whether your trade settled but and, and everyone is doing that right like and this market shouldn't be controlled by anyone and for this type of application you just can't have users be a, a, a secret shareholder of the state right um, yeah, it, for for permission setting where everyone can just come into this market, use it, and leave. Right. Um, 
the online offline will be too different to guarantee because there is also a problem is that if like for example a lot of the node disappear then the data will not be able to be decrypt right that's what we want uh you know two-thirds on, uh, honest and you know these are blockchain node operators um and you know it's, it's more reliable than user you know commodity machines i would say um you know that we, we're currently think of at least for, for a lot of networks you know with the the node blockchain nodes are assumed to be relatively stable and you know stable network connection good hardware um so so we can, I, I think it's it's really like what type of application we're thinking about it's like for like small scale applications where you have a couple of people that want to get together compute over the secret data MPC is like great for that right um, I am actually kind of thinking about a very specific application that FHG might be useful and it's actually very simple it's like uh well that is basically misery killer games so basically that six people two of them are murder and the other four people are just like regular and the two people can kill other people basically like that and an uh, important part about doing this in casting on chain and decentralized is basically to have a random assignment of the character that's which two people will be the murder and this need to be fair this also need to be secret this could be done in fhe there are so many ways to do that. And basically just that, like everyone can kind of create a array of one, two, six, three, four, five, six, and everyone apply a permutation. FHE have the benefit because it can reduce the number of rounds into like sublinear. And the problem that really about using that on chain will be about something that we didn't talk about today is the public key size and the self-test size. Mm -hmm. And so Basically, that there are other applications that are not doing general purpose computation. There are also not going to be a lot of the user involved, and it might be a one-off things. And the purpose of the FHE compared to other like solution is that it may require fewer rounds. And therefore, if we do in testing on chain, you don't need to let the user to wait for 12 seconds for the previous person to kind of shuffle the cards or like something like that. So yeah, that's one application of FHE. Well, I'm not like sure about, I think that actually three things here. The public key size, the second is the cipher test size. And the last thing is that for integrity, you might need a zero notch proof. Mm -hmm. But like, zero notch proof usually work on some specific field that are too large, and it might not natively work together with like FHE, which we clearly prefer small prime number. And probably we need just a few levels so that we also need to be careful about all these parameter. So that's basically, another line of the world where you use that on very 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 specific application and maybe the number of the user and so on is small enough and maybe you have a genuine reason about using fhe rather than any other solution for example here route complexity uh, i think these are great points I, I, this is actually a really good example i think i think it actually relates to single secret leader election uh you know this is just multiple role election uh if, if that makes sense right and you want to have a set number of number of roles right in, in this in this game uh, and I think maybe we also, I mean, FHE was like single secret leader election was sort of proposed, like, you know, FHE was one of the social FHE was one of the solutions, but now there's like more efficient solutions, right? So, so this actually may not require FHE either, I think. Uh, but the, but, you know, but I think there's like better examples on, on Ethereum, right? Like, you know, Uniswap or like lending markets are, are great examples for why, you know, we need, we need sh com computation on shared state that we want to keep private. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, th think about it from a developer experience perspective, right? If you're a developer of smart contracts, you don't want to have to think about building special purpose protocols for your application, right? What you want is just the ability to hide some data and then that's it. And I think FHE is nice in the sense that it adds, you know, this capability on top of existing platforms. So it looks very familiar to, uh, to developers. If you guys are interested, I think I think I'll have a demo of like an FHE EVM, like probably some point in the next three months. Uh, you know, I, I could I could show you guys I could show this here at some point. You know, if you guys are interested, um, you made a few comments about the key sizes and about levels and everything in zk. So you know, there are two types of FHE schemes. You have level schemes like CTKS and BGV, and these actually will never work for blockchain for two reasons. The first one is you know, you don't know how deep the computation is going to be, obviously, because, you know, your states might be updated an infinite number of time. Uh, uh, so you need something that's bootstrappable very efficiently. And the second thing is you want exact uh, computation. 
you cannot afford approximate computation on blockchain, you know? Uh, and, uh, you know, the level schemes, they can only do additions and multiplications. So if you want to do something as simple as, you know, checking that someone has enough tokens to send, so like a homomorphic comparison, you would have to approximate it somehow. And I don't know for you, but for me, I think either you have a million dollars or you don't, right? <laughs> it shouldn't be like approximately, you know, you're approximately passing the assertion. So there's one scheme which enables that, which is TFHE, which is the reason why we're using that. So with TFHE, you can guarantee the exactness of the computation, so there is no approximation. And it's bootstrap, so you don't have to worry about levels. So, so the concept of levels and approximation is not applicable if you use TFHE, it's only applicable to the other schemes. And for the ZK part, uh, you only really need to prove, and you can read uh, Wei's paper, he explains that already, you only need to prove the, that the user knows the inputs to the transaction. So the proof is not a proof of the FHE computation. It's a proof of plain text awareness during public key encryption. Uh, and that's a much, much easier problem to prove. And to give you a bit of a sense, um, right now, we're able to, proof, to prove a public encryption in FHE under one second of compute time. And the proof size is about 10 megabytes. So it's not bad, actually, you know, when you think about it. Uh, and that's after like, you know, three months of work. So probably going to do it better over time. Uh, what okay. you are right about, however, is that the ciphertexts are megabytes, right? And so there is a real question of block size and there is a real question of where you store all of these different things. Um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the block size is going to be huge and then that's it, right? Or maybe you store a hash of these of the ciphertext in the block and then you store the actual ciphertext itself on IPFS or something like that. Uh, you have to think a little bit creatively here, but but I think these are solvable. Yeah, when I was looking at the TFHE, firstly, in my use case, I can deal with level just because this is a time one-off computation after the- If it's one-off, you can. Yeah, mm. for TFHE, I think two problems. Firstly, is that like, uh, it's not being defined on, I, I know that time was defined on like, a fashionable number. So time is uh, different from like the other. I would say that I just don't know how easy it would be if I need to use ZK to reason about correct in, in, correct input, like input validi validity, and also like the, the correctness of the like encryption in the FHE. Mm -hmm. I think the, for example, in one of, in that application that I need to use, I need to let the user prove that I'm encrypting zero or one. Yep. And although TFHE naturally is already encrypting true and false, but I'm just not 100% sure about it. And also in my use case, I also need to encrypt one to six. So basically that like, I yeah. kind of have the feeling that somewhere I need to use a ZK. Actually, actually, actually TFHE can encrypt integers as well. Uh, the original version that was published a few years ago was just for Boolean values, but uh, you can do TFHE on, smart, on small integers. Uh, and then you can rebuild larger integers from that. So if you want like, you know, uh, up to eight bit integers, you can fit that into a single ciphertext in TFHE. The challenge that I have here is to prove that the user actually fit only a bit, or like for example, a number that's smaller than six somewhere. So basically that right. like, sums up the range proof. Yeah, 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 I see, I see. Uh, I see, yeah, I mean, someone would have to build that, but why not? I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be possible. I, you know, we just had to devise special schemes and, you know, um, you know, similar to how, you know, you try, we try to find fields, uh, special, you know, curves for, for different signature schemes, right? And I mean, you work on this, you know, I, I, you know, I remember your work finding this for EDSA. Um, yeah, I, I would assume that, you know, we want to customize and make this efficient. We'll have to, you know, like really have the two together we we'll figure out okay, which FTG scheme and you know what what is the underlying modulus and okay what do we use if we want to use a general secret solution to, to do range proofs what is a you know secret proof system we'll, we'll have or, or do we have specialized protocols to do range proofs for FTG encryption which is sounds like what kind of RAND is doing um and probably one other like research question that are appearing here is that threshold is kind of needed for this like gaming application. Why? Because this is user where we actually have, for example, just re-encryption. This would require some sort of like that. And the problem immediately coming to that. Usually when we do threshold decryption in FHE, you usually need a kind of a slack, kind of a space so that like the, the value will still be correct. And this always yeah. make the prime number a little bit larger. 
and yeah. level also is a concern. So basically that line, I clearly hope that the number is come some of about two, five, four bit so that you can use a curve that we that already have and doesn't need to go to a very high one. I think we will just wait for more progress there. Yeah, definitely. But there's like a, a huge ball based on uh, this paper, you know, this is like, um, yeah, like exponential blow up uh, in terms of number of parties that, that you throw into, into the threshold description, uh, in, like the modulus blow up at, at least that much. Uh, so, yeah, I I actually I don't know. Like this is something that you know uh, will be interesting to work on together. Um, like I actually never really so Pesca paper was like just a blueprint. I you know there's no details, like no instantiation of anything. Um, but yeah, these are definitely a lot of hard problems to be figured out when you actually want to build this. Yeah, so, uh, I basically the like problem that like a lot of the people are looking at is that for gaming, you actually only need a specific and a very small set of the functionality. Player number is never going to be huge. There is no 100 people misery pillar games. So basically that there are, are some specific application, very like specific random assignment and re-encryption might be just everything that the developer need. And you might just need a very specific and simple SDK provided to this like developer. All they need to know is that I can use your API to let some user be able to see that information some other user cannot. Very simple and very limited set of functionality and that can enable a large number of like on-chain blockchain, uh, on-chain games in the blockchain. Well, hmm? I, I wonder whether this single secret related election techniques can be applied there, right? Like it's just generalization of, of that, if it makes sense. You don't reveal who is the like murder until the end of the game. Yep. So. Yeah, G G games is actually a great use case for uh, on-chain privacy, right? Because uh, even like poker, for example, or like anything where you need to keep a secret until the end of the round, uh, right now you wouldn't be able to be on-chain. You need to either do it with ZK somehow or just not do it. So actually, this is something I'm very excited about. If you're if people are working on like you know games where you need secret on-chain. I'd love to hear more about that because that would help me also understand what kind of requirements are needed in terms of like performance and everything. And that's basically secret randomness because verifiable random function actually doesn't solve this problem because the randomness is public. In a mm -hmm. lot of the game that is not okay. Yeah. So it seems to me that um, these FHG driven blockchains have kind of two additional um, efficiency measures like you, because you have this decryption oracle and you know you care about the latency and the throughput of, of that decryption oracle for example um say i want to you know show off my nfts uh is it going to take like a minute for my for my uh pesca or zama metamask to load uh, my honorary wikileaks nfts like how how is that in practice uh short answer uh, we'll see in a few months Right uh, when we'll have a end-to-end -end working demo, I I think I think you know the good thing about the oracle is that there is no FHE computation involved, right? So you can put in place all kinds of caching mechanisms in order to you know make things much faster. Um, so, so I think like it's it's much easier to scale the oracle than it is to scale the computation because the computation you know at some point you have to actually do the FHE computation and that takes time. Um, uh, the the latency of the threshold oracle is more critical uh, for doing things like evaluating your assertions in your smart contract during execution, uh, because you know that could be a bottleneck for executing it. So even there, there is like some 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 thinking around how to streamline that. Um, but I would say like you know if if the oracle re replies in less than a few seconds, honestly, like you know. Uh, it's not that bad. Um, even 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 like thirty seconds, if it's just one time, like users don't move assets that often, right? So it's really just one time you have to make this decryption call, and then from that point, you know, this can be cached on the Oracle side, or it can be cached on your side. Like I think there would be strategies for improving the user experience. I think, by the way, the block size is like the size of like the, the cipher text to pass in transactions. That's a more tricky bottleneck uh, to, to figure out, I think, than the Oracle itself eventually. 
Cool, thanks. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, um, I'd just like to thank Wei and Rand as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone for all your time and uh, a really good discussion. And uh, hopefully I'll see you all next week. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone. Also, thanks guys. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you.